Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where you meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gottberg. Hello there. It's Shipping Podcast Friday. You know, every other Friday there is a new shipping podcast. And this is the 55th one. And I'm going to introduce you to Birgit Liodon, director of Nord Shipping. Or maybe she doesn't really need an introduction, because she's known by very many people, and she is very active on the international shipping arena. Birgit and I attend the same conferences from time to time. Usually it's a Vista conference somewhere in the world. But we hardly ever have the time to sit down together. This year, when the Vista International AGM and conference took place on board a cruise ship, the Koningstam, sailing from Fort Lauderdale to Bahamas and back again, we finally found a time to sit down, Birgit and me, and make this interview. It's a long one. Birgit is talking about her career, about being a member of Vista, how important sustainability is, and her new job as the director of Nor Shipping. I hope you will enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by the Swedish Club, a provider of top quality and cost-effective marine insurance solutions and services. The Shipping Podcast and the Swedish Club is cooperating through this year as well, which makes me very happy. So, upon request from many people, and suggested by previous guests, this is Birgit Liodon for you. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? My name is Birgit Liodon. I am Director of North Shipping, 34 years old and based in Oslo. How did you come into the shipping industry? It was purely by chance, and actually my original thoughts about shipping were quite negative. So the first time I was about invited to attend an interview at the Ville Wilhelmsen Group, I uh, even declined. So, uh, you know, um, among the 40% of industry colleagues who never thought about ending up in shipping, but still did. So what did you do before? Prior to that, I worked in the real estate industry, where I was, you know, I, I always thought I would still stick into that. And shipping is quite different from the real estate industry, so... <laughs> so, what did you do at Valenius Willensson? Well, I actually wasn't working for Valenius, but I uh, worked for the Ville Wilhelmsen Holding. Oh, so, the Norwegian sorry. owner of the Wilhelmsen Group. But I, um, I started working as a personal assistant for the um, Global Director of HR and OD. Then I uh, uh, volunteered to contribute on some new projects that they were moving into. And um, that kind of changed my career. I started up actually just as a temp for six months as a PA. Uh, after a few months, I was full-time uh, working as a project assistant and then a project coordinator for Wilhelmsen's first project of merging and, and um, bridging the entire global HR organization after purchasing Unitor. So I worked on the global HR IT systems for mm -hmm. five years. Oh, I see. And then what? Well, and then I, well, parallel to that, I, um, I started working with uh, Young Ship Oslo, which was an organization for young people who had just been launched first in Bergen and then in Oslo. A few years into my membership there, I took over as president of Young Ship Oslo and spent eventually, I think, 30% uh, of a full-time position on top of a full-time position in Wilhelmsen to work for the young generation. And back in the autumn of 2010, I started looking at some really exciting opportunities for young ship that wasn't realized. And I saw that I couldn't fulfill those opportunities uh, and still continuing as 
as a global project manager at Redemption, which was then my level. Uh, so I decided to hand in my resignation notes and start my own company so that I would have the freedom and the uh, resources to uh, to really fast track young ship ahead into uh, an international organization. So when did that happen? And how did it happen? It, well, um, I, I had my last working day in, in Wilhelmsen in January 2011 as an employee. So I started working on kind of building a, the, the strategy, building a structure for how we could lift and develop young ship without any funding. And then during the spring of 2011, actually during your shipping 2011, uh, the Norwegian Ship Owners Association approached me following a speech I did at North Shipping about Young Ship and wanted to establish a closer corporation. So that was our first founding sponsor at uh, Young Ship. And of course, parallel to that, I took on various project management assignments. So I worked for North Shipping, I worked for the, took on a project for the um, future of the port cities for OECD. I um, worked as a project manager for a Nigerian offshore company in Lagos, Nigeria, based there for some months. Uh, and I also did a small project for the Wilhelmsen Group as well. So it was, you know, a good mix of, of spending time to develop uh, young ship and at the same time testing out, gaining, you know, the, the insight, knowledge, exposure towards quite different environments and different, very different types of organizations and, and regions, basically. So in the autumn of 2011, Young Ship International was formally established as an NGO. The same fall, I traveled to Cyprus for the uh, Maritime Cyprus Week, where I did the presentation about actually social media <laughs> uh, and the next generation and potential impacts for the industry um, in, the, in a period where, you know, there was really a lot less focus on it and many companies were still arguing whether they would at all allow their employees to use Facebook, for instance. <laughs> and, uh, and my visit to Cyprus led to the establishment of Young Ship Cyprus. And uh, in parallel to that, we had an, an, a dialogue uh, with uh, Brazil which uh, formed Young Ship Rio, and then, you know, you had the ball rolling. <laughs> so whenever I would go out and do presentations, you spoke to new people who were enthusiastic, and you built these bonds globally, and actually realized a lot of the potential that I saw and had seen that we could utilize. So um, then when I left Young Ship for, let's see here, Four and a half years later, the organization was consisting of 18 branches in 12 countries. Wow. So including Kenya and Texas, who were the last ones on board before I handed on the wheel to my predecessor. That's impressive. And it must have been so much fun to do it. It was really so much fun. And I mean, you know, it's a true entrepreneurial experience because I think you have this you have this vision and you have a strong drive for something that you really, really believe in. And you don't really have a lot of resources to build on. I mean, we, did, you know, we, didn't have, we didn't have travel budgets. We didn't have marketing budgets. So all contacts, all marketing or promotion that we did were through social media. All the traveling that I was doing would either had to be, you know, covered by the organizer or I would have to fund it for my own company uh, and I think you know that that kind of experience is quite healthy because it's something that we tend to forget when we're part of big organizations you know where you, you have the budgets even though now our industry is facing such a rough time that uh, that budgets are being cut but still you know there is for most organizations a lot of fat there is a lot of resources being underutilized uh, so I think it's um, it's a really interesting journey that you enter into when you start on your own. I like agree. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, but it's so much freedom 
It is, and that's what I really, really liked. And, and I even, you know, one year before I accepted the role at North Shipping, I even said on on Norwegian national TV that I would never again go back to taking on the leader role in a more kind of established organization, just because of that kind of the, that freedom that you have and, and the the span of creativity. Where I mean, you 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 explore new opportunities on the way and you kind of you adapt and you twist and turn and you meet people and things happen it, it's it's amazing it's really exciting so. talking about that i remember when the first times i saw you or met with you when you gave speeches and so on and you were a bit complaining about the lack of role models in our industry Yeah, that's that has been you know my big big battle I think <laughs> towards the industry, and actually I started. It's funny earlier this fall I just spoke with um, I think it was Christine Klavenes, uh, one of the owners of the Klavenes Group, because my initial exposure to being on a stage and talking in front of the industry was a complete coincidence, because I was part of a group that. Uh, established Oslo Shipping Exchange, which was a forum, professional forum, building an arena for all the different generations, all parts of the industry in the area around Oslo. And uh, alongside the other organizers who were all, you know, quite mature men, <laughs> um, uh, there was a discussion and, they, you know, they had already booked in a range of top executives, all men. And then they wanted to have a female speaker as well. So I was given the task to, you know, contact the various young female ship owners. And, you know, so I called and nobody wanted to join. <laughs> and um, and eventually the other organizers, they just told me that, oh, well, you know, Birgit, then you just, you have to do it. And I was like, wow, me? I've never done something like that in my life. And I'm scared sh so you know, even talking in front of, 20 people. <laughs> But of course, I've, I, I think I've always had some in terms of, you know, when I'm first put into a situation where I have to just jump, I do jump and then I'm not really taking the easy way out. <laughs> so uh, as I didn't represent the shipping company as such as, as an owner, um, I, I wanted to make sure that I was speaking about something that I felt was important for the young generation and important for the industry and where I could challenge the established part of the industry in a good way. Uh, so that's basically how it started. But anyway, what I presented then and what I have talked a lot about later as well is that we are an industry that deals most with other persons in the same industry we're kind of we're living in our own shipping bubble so to say and that's very you know convenient it's very comfortable also we have we have a very strong pride i think in what we do in the shipping industry you know we have this saying that Shipping is the bloodstream of global trade, and without shipping, half the world would starve and the other half would freeze. And that's good, but the only problem is that the rest of the world doesn't necessarily see it that way. They don't see us. And when they see us, they see white man 50 plus talking about tax, quarterly results, um, Maybe there has been an oil spill related to an accident. Maybe there has been some piracy activity, uh, etc. So, I mean, it's, it's it's not something that generates a huge interest and and passion among the global community about our industry because it is, you know, profiles and topics that very few really can relate to and, and it doesn't really touch people from the bottom of their hearts, you know. So what I challenged the industry to do was, I mean, um, looking at the young people working in shipping. They love the industry. They love their jobs. They are so enthusiastic. And, and you know, they work 24-7, basically. It's more than a job for people. It's a lifestyle. So I have been, you know, challenging proactively the industry to utilize that 
and to show and display that passion and, and those role models to a bigger degree. Because I think that, uh, first of all, yes, shipping is an important problem solver for the world because we supply transportation, right? But we need to, to share that story with the world in a different way than we have done today. Because I think we had a really great guy and also a few years ago who I invited to talk uh, with industry who explained shipping as a, what did they say, like a grain industry. You know, when you bake a cake, uh, you focus on this was a really good cake. It's excellent. This is, your, you know, the consumer will focus on the cake that he or she finds in the bakery store. And they don't really reflect on what kind of flour you put into it. Or, or the process of how this cake became a cake. And it's the same with shipping. The service that we provide to the global society, it's, you know, invisible. The big ports are very often moved out of the residential areas due to, you know, noise, uh, transportation, emissions, etc., etc. So it means that in the local societies, people don't have that close relationship with the ports anymore that they used to have. I mean, the ports used to be like, you know, bussing with people and, and, and you know, the kind of the, the heart of the city, but they're not anymore. So we need to find different ways of showcasing what we are doing. We also need to find new ways of actually contributing and, and providing value to global societies so that we can actually prove that we actually make a change. And um, I have very often chosen to, to illustrate the view of young people working in shipping. They kind of see themselves as Superman. The rest of the world perceives the shipping industry as Scrooge. And, you know, there are so many negative and, and not very attractive features <laughs> to that last picture. And if we could work together as an industry to to turn that picture more towards the Superman complex, I think that would be very healthy for us. Because our image, or lack of image, lack of visibility, lack of participation in the global debates and in the community debates, it's a huge hinder for us because we need a lot of skilled people. Even now when we are in a decline period, we still need good people. There are so many new competences and skills that we will need into this industry in the years to come. And how will these right people choose our industry and actually choose to join us in fight for creating shipping better if we are not, you know, in, in any way appealing to them? Or even, you know, on the radar when they are going to choose their profession. I agree. I don't have to put my questions to you because you're answering <laughs> all my questions. I put the same questions to all my guests. Yeah. And I talk about uh, visibility and uh, we're coming to a few more. But, but what you're talking about now, both role models and visibility, I think it's so important. And since I started my podcast a year ago, a year and a half ago, I almost never speak to the people in shipping anymore. I speak to the people outside shipping that comes back to me and ask me questions about shipping because I have made shipping available on iTunes exactly. where no one else is. And my wish is that more people will download it and, and make reviews because then eventually it will sort of hit the top lists and just... Uh, accidentally come into people's mobiles and listening to us hmm. as an industry. And I think that that's a, something that has been on, on my agenda a lot, moving our focus also towards the other parts of society. Because, I mean, if we as leaders within the maritime industry or talents or, you know, any, any profile within the industry, whether we're young or older, male, female, Western, Eastern, if we, to a bigger degree, actually participate and are active in society discussions, that also helps putting shipping on the radar. And I mean, when, when I do presentations and talks and when I spend my time in whether, you know, different networks and conferences, etc., etc., I, I don't focus just on shipping. 
So I spend a lot of my time in tech networks and I, I contribute as panelist or keynote or moderator for tech conferences, for instance, which is an industry that will impact our industry hugely in the years to come. And, and I think, I think the Germans are actually quite better at looking outside the the shipping box because they have a lot of people coming in from other industries into shipping so that helps but i think we we should really look more into what the other industries who are also our customers i mean the cargo owners uh, we should look much more into what they are doing and how they are prioritizing how they are changing how they are utilizing the digital shift how they are working with communication, branding, etc., etc. We need to learn from them because we can't just sit inside our own shipping bubble and reinvent the wheel every time. And I think no, we are... it can't be reinvented now. I think no. it's broken. So we need to come up with something new. <laughs> exactly. And also as a part of the logistical chain, if the other parts of that logistical chain is changing, but we are not, then we are lost. Yeah, well then, or at least we will be disrupted. Within our industry, we have a lot of mechanisms in the maritime value chain that aren't working optimally. And I think that if we don't do something about it, if we don't come up with a better business model for the industry, then somebody else will. And a good example of that is is Amazon, who has chosen to, you know, basically take the the transportation logistic value chain back into their own operations to secure the control because they believe that they can do it more efficient, more transparent, with better use of data, etc., etc., than our industry. And that's a signal that I think it's so important that our industry actually acknowledge the potential impact of and act upon because that's what is happening in a lot of other industries as well. And very often when people talk about the digital shift, they have a strong focus on the fact that you have now actors coming in who don't own assets. They just create portals. But another common factor for those actors, which I have found, is these actors who come in and disrupt. They have very often been customers of the disrupted industry. So that means that, you know, if we have customers who see that they can provide the services that we provide in a better way, they will do it. They can do it because of the digital technologies that we have at hand these days. And our industry is so bad at utilizing those technologies. And we're so afraid to share. We sit in our silos, both, you know, between whether it's competing uh, ship owning companies or whether it's between the different parts of the supply chain we think in very old-fashioned silo ways rather than thinking across finding new opportunities by just kind of re-establishing our own industry truths and being open to acknowledge that yes we are an industry who has been existing for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years but it still might be that we don't know what's best. I think that as an industry, we really need to be humble to the fact that there are new technologies coming in, new competences, which most of the maritime companies I know, at least, really lack. I I see that, you know, most shipping companies, they would never dream about having boards or management groups without the right financial competence. Uh, legal competence or operational slash commercial competence, right? But at the same time, I don't know, I, I think I can count on one hand, maybe two, all the companies I know in our industry globally who has secured digital competence in their boards, in their management groups, or hired a CDO, Chief Digital Officer. And due to that, I mean, when we are now moving into this phase where we have to reinvent the wheel, (laughs) or when we have to actually reinvent our own business models, when we have to to change the way that we act, we have to, uh, to recruit and attract new competence without 
then having the right competence on the top levels, you won't know how to recruit and develop and make the right directions and investments further down in the value chain. And I just, I feel sometimes that we're still, you know, we're just running full speed ahead towards the cliff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I often hear that the boards or the, the management team has the, delegated the responsibility of the digitalization of the company to someone at the IT department, and then yeah, I get and, lost. And, 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 and that scares me also, because, I mean, that, that's another thing that I hear so very often in our industry, is that when people talk about, you know, digitizing the uh, the revenue streams or new business models, blah, 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 they they think about and talk about new IT systems. Yeah. And the way that many believes that they can, you know, become digital is just, you know, by buying another IT system, hire a new IT manager. And I think that at least when I talk about digital competence, I, I talk about a different type of competence where you have, of course, a strong tech competence that you can relate more maybe to the kind of traditional IT function. But you also have that combined with business development, find, you know, new products, new revenue streams. So it's more actually in the sphere of product services rather than just thinking about the what is the kind of internal infrastructure. So it's, um, I think that when companies start looking, they, they risk to do so many bad investments by not ensuring the right competence on the top levels first. And then, of course, it's what what can save a lot of companies if they recognize it and, and manage to utilize it is that a lot of the companies in our industry has more of that competence in the lowest ranks of their company than in the higher ones. And that's quite interesting, as I see it from, from my perspective, that kind of changes the power balance because the top executives, they will need to learn from the next generation to yes. handle this shift. Yeah. That means that if you don't ensure that you have digital competence in the board or hire someone in the management group with that kind of competence, at least what you should do is make sure that the top executives get themselves a young digital mentor from the lower ranks of the company. Which I, which I hear now that shipping <laughs> companies actually are doing. Yeah, which mm. is a good thing because, I mean, okay, then you, if you didn't have that competence, you know, you can still learn, you can still explore and build from there. But then again, I mean, if we talk about the average ship owner, that is a family-owned company with five to ten ships. Mm. So who will bring the digital competence into that? company? Well, I think that, you know, in family-owned companies, you have a tradition for building different kind of competence that you will need moving forward among various members of the family. So, for instance, you would see that, you know, one one of the next generation goes into law, one moves into the more kind of taking of financial education, etc. One heads off and, and takes a, um, a shipping degree. So, um, I would assume that with the next generation taking over the wheels in many shipping companies, that they would also recognize that, that it, building the digital competence would be equivalent to those other competences that you normally secure for the company, in even my, though there are small companies as well. Okay. In my view, the new role, role models, my heroes, are the ones who are the second, third or fourth generation of young ship owners, you see them now mm. because they are moving into the business because of the, the bad times has been bad for such a long time. So the elderly generation retires, leaving it over to the, the younger generation. Yeah. So I can see the change. Yeah, and I think that the next generation or the, the young ship owners coming into the industry now are thinking quite differently. And I think they have to because there is no champagne age now. It's just a lot of hard work <laughs> where you have to just get your hands dirty and and just work and try to turn things. I would also assume, and I see that, you know, you have a lot of alliances built now, 
you have uh, charter pools. Uh, companies will have to find new ways also of working together with other companies. I think this will be period in the industry also consolidating the industry. Not only the shipping companies, a lot of other companies as well, but I mean, there are so many companies who have now first during the last financial crisis, you know, lived on their savings and now it's through. The margins are still low. Uh, markets are bad. Uh, maybe they will be even better. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and so they also need to find new ways of, of building alliances, finding new partners so that they can thrive and succeed. And I think that, that a very good thing with the young generation is that I think, you know, the, the millennials and those who are a bit older than that and also younger have a different concept and interest for working together and, and recognizing, realizing that it's better to have a smaller part of a bigger cake than try and sit with the whole cake for yourself. Because the cake is getting smaller then. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, um, and, and I mean, I, I, when I talk to young ship owners from different parts of the world, I think that they're, you know, quite prepared for having to think differently. Definitely. And I mean, it, I would say that, you know, taking over a shipping company in these days, it's a big challenge. So we have now so many... The, I mean, new rules, regulations that uh, adds costs, uh, the digital shift. We also see that the world is slowly moving towards a more sustainability-focused direction. And where I'm very curious now to see how the COP21 agreement will impact. Because even though shipping isn't directly affected, it will affect the cargo owners and then it will be interesting to see how well the cargo owners, when they are faced with new requirements in terms of CO2 footprints and becoming probably more responsible for your own emissions throughout the value chain of your production process. It will be interesting to see how they will use or work with the shipping industry to find ways of, of reducing mm. the footprint. Mm. And also how how they can maybe even find that the shipping industry can be kind of a problem solver for them in that process. Let's talk about your current position. Yay! What is it like to be a director of no shipping? It is amazing. It's fantastic. It's so much fun. How that, did that happen? That was kind of crazy. Uh, I was seven months pregnant with my second child and received a phone call during summer vacation from a headhunter who asked me if I was interested in meeting them to talk about an open position. And, you know, I, I ran my own company and I actually had some really interesting dialogues with some other people um, with the plans of you know, growing my company after I had, you know, delivered the baby and was done with the so-called maternity leave, which is what you have when you run your own company and have babies. <laughs> and um, this part of your life is not necessarily when you really expect to be very attractive on the work market in our industry, to be quite frank, <laughs> because that's when you see you have like the mummy trap. Uh, where girls are not really that attractive, either if people think they will have babies or if they just had them. So I, um, I had a really nice talk with them, uh, and uh, I think the first question I asked them was, well, did you call the right number? <laughs> because first of all, I, I hadn't really seen myself as um, you know, a candidate on that level with North Shipping being one of the biggest and most important maritime event weeks of the world, me quite young. They never had a director below 50. They never had a female. Also, I'm, you know, I think I've made my mark on, you know, challenging the industry quite a bit. I guess I'm somewhat of a rebel. So it's a quite interesting perspective, you know, to, to see them looking at me as an... Um, as a relevant candidate. 
And then I asked them, you know, if they actually had called the right number and if they realized that I was just about to have a baby and was planning on <laughs> having a maternity leave as well. And they said that they were willing to wait for the right candidates. And uh, apparently they had talked to a lot of people in the industry who had recommended me, which was, you know, great honor. And then I went through some, some interviews and landed on, firstly, I felt that I had a lot to contribute with in this position. And secondly, I felt that if the industry and good people in the industry believed that I would do a good job in that role, I would definitely not be the one to stop myself. So uh, I accepted a role and then I actually had the fantastic opportunity of spending seven months to develop the new strategy for new shipping. Because, I mean, when do you normally have the opportunity to free yourself of every daily ad hoc task, you know, to sit down and just focus on strategy? That's not very often. And that was an amazing timing of doing that while you're in maternity leave. So, um, so we also hired a new project manager for, uh, for no shipping, Per Martin Tangor, who has a background from Wurzla and from uh, Lundsta Stomoko ship workers in, in Singapore. And he was also on parental leave. So we basically sat in my kitchen working on strategy, uh, while the babies were crawling around. <laughs> kind of untraditional strategy process, I think. <laughs> And one of the very early decisions that I made and that I told the board about with ref to the, the recruitment of me into an worshipping position was that I, I set some requirements because I'm not really an A4 person. And that can be a good thing if you have the right mandates. And it can also be a bad thing if people don't realize what that means. So I negotiated my contract not just focusing on the salary and benefits and those things but i uh, negotiated into my contract the ability to to continue to be politically incorrect to have the ability to still challenge the industry from within and then i negotiated my values into the contract to and the freedom to use nor shipping as a tool for promoting and stimulating sustainability, diversity, transparency, focus on entrepreneurs, innovation, the next generation, women, etc. And with that as a fundament, uh, I saw also with Nor Shipping a lot of unrealized potential. Because Nor Shipping already has a position as the I think the benchmark for other maritime event weeks when it comes to the formats and innovation. But at the same time, there are a lot of things that we haven't done yet. Some of them, which we are doing now. And uh, what I was looking for was, you know, not only to cover what goes on in the industry, but actually take a focus on proactively challenging the industry, provoking the industry, inspiring the industry uh, to think new. And to be, you know, one of those voices or instruments in the maritime industry globally that can help to push and, and drive the industry in the right direction. So that's what we're doing now. And as a result, Nor Shipping has a key focus to, to function as a catalyst for change, is what we call it, kind of the, the main focus of what we do. And that that's something that we're doing in many different ways. What we also did was that we... Um, based our entire strategy on the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the NVGL's work for UN Global Compact addressing business as the key tool and driving force for the world to be able to reach the SDGs. So that means that with this combination of our perspectives and the way that we have kind of built a different context into what we do, that challenges us from within to come up with new tools and new ways of working with the industry. And um, also I've, I've taken kind of my entrepreneurial experience into the role 
So we challenged the industry to embrace potential disruptors and to, to work with entrepreneurs to drive innovation. And that's also something that we do from the inside. So we work uh, with a methodology that we call crowdsourcing by Norshipping. And that's a method that we have implemented in several new projects that we're doing for 2017. Which is kind of cool because I have a strong focus and believe that we need to break silos. And we need to not just sit in our small individual bubbles as an organization or a company. We need to work horizontally, right? So that means that for nor shipping, we also need to do that. So we work a lot more on horizontal levels. So now we do moving towards next year uh, and launching now in, in November, we uh, come out with two digital campaigns for and with the industry, where the first campaign is called From Problem to Profit. And we have translated the 17 sustainable development goals into seven maritime goals. And then we have split each of those goals into two to three pain points, important areas that the industry is working on resolving, but has not yet resolved. Right? And then we create some pitches, video pitches for these areas that we present to the generation via social media. And the format that we use are videos. Uh, and then you have YouTube as one source, of course, and uh, which is where a lot of young people are. And then we, uh, you know, we highlight what the industry already does on the area. We highlight why it's a problem and why it's important in a global context so that we build the connection between the young person and the global community and shipping. And then we invite uh, the young persons to share with us their ideas, their projects, their concepts, which are representing new potential for innovation into the industry. And the target group for our campaign are young people everywhere. It is uh, students, it is young entrepreneurs, and it's also young people already working in the shipping industry. So we go out quite broadly and we invite them to you know, work on this. If they're a student, they can work on those projects as part of their study and so that they can link to something that is relevant for the industry. Make sure that their education and their practical work during the education actually has a good relevance. If they are an entrepreneur, uh, it might be that their entrepreneurial project or their company is already working on something that addresses this problem, right? And if it's uh, a young person already working in a company in the shipping industry, uh, it might be that they have seen something, they have some ideas that don't necessarily fit into the core strategy of their own company, but it can still be something that can benefit the industry as a whole. So there the, the crowdsourcing mentality comes in by crowdsourcing ideas, input from the next generation towards more shipping. And we then invite them to share with us their kind of problem solving or their pitch, their idea through short videos, which we call Ocean Opportunity Talks. Uh, and then we will be sharing those with the entire industry. And we, it's an open project so that we invite as many companies and, and stakeholders from the industry in as possible. Universities, entrepreneurial hubs, big cluster organizations, key maritime organizations into contributing. And then the outcome of the project will be open to the entire industry. So it's not something that we just keep for us. This is something that we do because we really believe that it's so important that our industry starts sharing more and, you know, kind of removing the old silos and just thinking in a different way and just utilizing each other's ideas and heads and different perspectives and views. And then when we reach North Shipping next year, we will use uh, some of the best input that has come from the young generation throughout the week in different formats and conferences, etc., in a digital uh, manner. And the last day of North Shipping, we invite the five best contributors to join an Ocean Opportunity pitch session where they will be invited to pitch in front of investors, top executives from the industry, 
business angels, etc. And they will be able to compete for, and it will be a little bit different prices depending on which type of person they are. But as a student, you can compete for a summer internship, you can compete for a mentor, you can compete for a cash prize. And we have now just landed some agreements with a, a network for business angels so that there will be some good opportunities to actually get uh, some investors on board if you are an actual entrepreneur. That sounds cool and it's, fun. It's fun and it's, you know, it's a little bit different. And we wanted to, you know, bring something different into the industry now because we are in, in the middle of several big shifts and there is also a massive kind of depression in parts of the industry as well because people are struggling so hard to find the new solutions and new opportunities. A lot of companies have to uh, scale down, uh, lay off people, cut costs, and that's tough. That's really tough. So we wanted to you know, acknowledge that and still bring some new enthusiasm into this and, and to really to fast track new ideas coming in. Because, you know, the opportunities are there. It's just that it's difficult to find them when the markets are down and when you're lagging behind on new technologies. So our ambition has been that to to help and really support the industry in this period. And we are currently attending the Vista International Conference. Yeah. And you are a member of Vista in Norway. Yeah, I am. And also a board member. How did you become a member? What? did you think about Vista before you were a member? Um, you know, before I was a member, I actually didn't know much about Vista. Because, you know, when I started, I, w- I didn't have any managerial role. And I think I joined Vista back in 2009, 2010, maybe. And then I was, I think, a quite active member until the spring of 2012, when I was really surprisingly nominated and then elected as the Norwegian Personality of the Year. And after that, I was also invited to take a board position. I was also kind of representing the young generation into the WISTA board of Norway. And, you know, for me, WISTA has been a really, really important organization and network. And I use my WISTA network, I think, every week and across completely different parts of the world and for different purposes. But it has been, I think for me also as um, a young person who quite early took on uh, leadership roles, uh, it has given me a lot of really good security, you know, and uh, you have all of these people to spar with in terms of experiences that you go through, some experiences that you have that are tougher than others and where, you know, you're really looking for some good advice and other people's insights from similar experiences that they have had. And and that's what Vista really provides for me. Also, I've seen that, um, you know, I have this mentality of uh, paying it forward. So I think that with Vista as an organization for leaders, for female leaders in the maritime industry, we have such a lot of potential for really lifting forward the female role models and encouraging the young generation of women to join our industry. Now I'm on this international AGM for the, I think it's for the fourth time now, which is also an amazing experience each year. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Because, I mean, you have like 300 female leaders from 40 plus countries. And that is, it adds some dimensions that you wouldn't get without it. Just also focusing on gender within no shipping. Yeah, we have. And, and that's, you know, linked to my general passion for diversity. You know, you have a lot of companies that focus on diversity due to CSR reasons. And I I think that's bull****. <laughs> and I think that if you want to create diversity, you really have to believe in what diversity can bring you from a financial perspective. And I believe personally that diversity is really important, not just across gender, but across age, across geographical, cultural background etc. And I think that it's just about getting more voices and, and more perspectives 
to the table in any company or your organization. And then using that for making the best decisions. And I think that if we don't have diversity, what we risk is to create a mindset of kind of group thinking, where people are just confirming each other's views rather than challenging them, you know. And with Norshipping, uh, as I mentioned, one of the values that I negotiated in was diversity. And we have chosen to dedicate ourselves towards diversity in several ways. So the first one is that we recruited new people into our advisory board so that we increased the women's share, only with I would say some of the most skilled and competent women in the Norwegian shipping industry. We also set a requirement that all of our conferences and all of our workshops, seminars organized by Nor Shipping formally, or where we are a partner, all of them needs to have diversity in the panels. So you have no more all male white panels or no more all 50 plus panels or no more all white panels i mean it's kind of i i think that it's just natural we are a a global industry we need the next generation voices in we need to make sure that we get all the best and brightest heads and the best competence into our industry so we have to make sure that we don't exclude 50 percent of the population due to gender bias (laughs) Other things that we have done on diversity is that we um, have entered in as a sponsor of Wista in Norway, and we are doing a third official big conference, which is now taking place at Norshipping next year for the second time, which is a Waves of Change conference. And it is a conference in cooperation and partnership with Wista that is focused on value-based leadership for an industry in change. Uh, open to both men and women open to both men and women because th- that's another thing you know uh, I don't support you know pushing the guys out either because then it, with all women you still don't have diversity do you <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> so the, the, the conference is organized by Nor Shipping and Wista uh, there is approximately you know 50-50 gender split on the panels and we hope to have even more men in the audience next year as well I think there was like third men and two thirds women last yeah. time. Yeah. We are also doing a another interesting project, which I hope that maybe this podcast can secure some more tips on. Uh, we're doing a um, a project towards again next Nor Shipping next spring that will be launched just before Nor Shipping, where we are now hunting for the most influential women of international shipping. The reason for that is that. Very often when I travel, I visit, you know, these conferences and meetings where I talk to people and there are few women in the panels, there are few women in the audience. I talk to a lot of people who say that they want to have more women as speakers. They want to have more women in boards, in management groups, etc. But it's so difficult to find them. So I thought, well, then let's make it easier. So let's just, you know, basically crowdsource a global list of the best and most competent and influential women of international shipping. So that's what we're doing. (laughs) So our aim is basically now to create this kind of catalog or kind of, what do you say, Bible for if you're looking for great women in shipping, here they are. (laughs) Good. And uh, another important element of that, of course, is also to have that functioning as a way of of promoting female role models to the next generation. To actually make younger girls in their early age of their career or or on, you know, mid-managerial levels realize just how many women are in really important positions where they create impact in our industry. Because I also think that coming from the real estate industry, that I did, you know, they say that shipping is male dominated industry, but there's so many women in the shipping industry. Maybe not necessarily always evenly distributed across all levels or parts of the pipeline, but I mean, still, there are so many women working in shipping. I came from a male dominated industry and I don't think shipping is that bad. <laughs> Good. But we need to, but there is a, there is a tradition for 
female leaders in shipping to to stay kind of under the radar and that's a big challenge because you don't know where to find them uh, and the next generation whether it's uh, male or female looking for new role models and people to be inspired from that they need the women also to be more visible and I think I contribute because I've got 50% female yeah, guests I on my podcast you do, and that's great and I'm also challenging all maritime organizers of events mm. because there are so many women just tell us what you want them to talk about and we'll tell you where to find them exactly and and you know um that's something that on the international women's day back on 8th march we went out with a press release about our plans to make this women's list and we also communicated that our ambition from nor shipping is to be the arena in the maritime industry that is best at promoting diversity and we have challenged all the other maritime event weeks and big conferences to take up the competition with us so that it will be difficult to maintain that position we aim to be best and we surely hope that all the other arenas will make that number one place extremely extremely hard to reach because i think that could do some really good things for our industry. I agree. I definitely agree. It's a great initiative. Congratulations on that one. Thank you. Another thing that we're doing is, uh, you know, uh, acknowledging the the shifts that we're in in terms of technology is that we have a quite cool project in the pipeline for next year uh, where we create an arena for uh, bridging the tech industry and the maritime industry during our shipping. Because what, what I saw, I was attending um, something that is called South by Southwest. And I was so in... <laughs> jealous. I was so jealous. <laughs> in Austin and Texas back in March. And, you know, it's one of the most important tech events in the whole wild world, right? And they have 500,000 delegates and whereof, you know, 80,000 official delegates. Those are the delegates, you know, who actually purchase the pass and, and have the badge. And I went through all the delegates and, you know, all other industries are represented. Aviation, the space industry, um, you have all the big car manufacturers are there. So you meet like the top executives from like Ford and Toyota and Tesla and whatever. You have farming, you have... Um, all kind of parts of the medical industry, etc., etc., etc. You know, all industries are there, with one big exception, <laughs> and that the, is the shipping. most important. I one. mean, the maritime industry among eighty thousand delegates, as far as I could see, based on the information contributed by the registered delegates, I was the only person from shipping, and that's yeah. crazy. But we have our own bubble. It's crazy. Let's I, live in our own bubble. Yeah. We don't need to attend the it's world. It's very comfortable mm, yeah. until our markets are taken from us. Yeah. So well. So so you know, realizing that and and also working on some cluster approach for next year, we decided to create. If shipping doesn't come to tech, let's bring tech to shipping. And we have you know a huge span of highly technological companies in our industry. The huge challenge is that you know. The suppliers and, you know, the, the companies such as ABB, Kongsberg, Wärtsilar, Rolls-Royce, etc., you know, they are so high-tech, but they don't have the customers to appreciate it. So you have a lot more technology available to shipping than what you actually use. Yes, yeah. Due to the kind of the, the mindset of thinking of technology as a cost rather than an investment. Yeah. So we, we know that we have a lot of them and, and still more are needed and we need to get the tech actors who are not at all involved in shipping as well to see what they do what we can learn from them and I, and I think that shipping should also be as proactive as to say that we shouldn't wait to be disrupted but we should rather now look at ways um, in which how we can disrupt other industries because I mean we have the huge assets the ships and the, the rigs, the floating ones. And we should maybe start thinking about how can ships be used in the future in completely different ways. And how can connected ships and a more connected maritime industry serve the world in different ways than we do today. 
and through that create new revenue streams and really step up as the problem solvers of the world. I think that could be holding some great potentials for taking us out of the mess we're in now. To think new and to have that customer center focus as the core all the time. To see that we're in a world now that is changing so much. And, and we have huge urbanization, which, you know, would, will just continue to increase in the years and decades to come. So how can shipping help communities? How can shipping help countries and cities and urban areas to solve their practical problems and create new business on that? When our traditional liner business is going kind of slow. <laughs> so we, um, we're building that arena next year and we have dedicated an entire hole to it. For next door shipping we're creating a a hole that is not like anything you've seen at the maritime exhibition before my vision of that hole is to create a disneyland for shipping nerds and tech nerds regardless of which level they're on you know in their companies and the hole will also function as kind of a bridge builder between the main conferences that we have and the other holes in the exhibition it will be completely dark. You won't be able to be there as individual company. You have to be there in clusters. You have to, you're not allowed to have any walls. So we're, you know, we're breaking the silos. We're enforcing uh, the actors to think in new ways to create a different experience. Do you think they will dare to come? You mean the exhibitors or the audience? No, no. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> I understand what you're talking about, mm. but people, they think that I'm too far ahead and I can mm. feel that you are ahead of everyone else. Mm. And being far ahead of everyone else, that means I challenge them. Mm. It does. And it's and easier to, have, um... to walk away than to maybe participate. It takes a bold person to participate. Yeah. And, and you know, that's also why we have worked with some of the most innovative spearhead focused companies in the industry. Because we know that our industry, you know, that there's a huge difference between the mindset of different companies. And we really acknowledge that, in, you know, we have, it, that's kind of something that is very fun and fascinating about shipping as I see it, that we are, you know, parts of the industry where we're a conservative industry and we are perceived to be a conservative industry. At the same time, we are a really innovative industry. Cutting edge. So it's a very, you know, we, there is such complexity of operations and technology and i mean we have entered the ocean space we have like in norway you have nasa coming to norway to learn from what we're doing in the ocean space and then you know gaining the competence that they will use in outer space so i mean we should be ashamed of of lack of, of, of technology skills but the industry is also so diverse that there are huge differences between different parts of the industry, both uh, not necessarily geographically speaking, but more maybe within parts of the value chain, which type of function you deliver. But, you know, Norway is also, um, together with a few other countries, among, I think, the kind of the high-tech provokers of the industry. There's a lot of, you know, maritime innovation coming out of the Nordic countries. So it's only natural that nor shipping as an arena, gathering the maritime industry f to think about and kind of explore the future, that we should also strive for being that horse head ahead, you know? Because I, I also think that our industry needs inspiration. I think that's really important. It's just the same that you see in, in countries that are facing, you know, a, a decline and people becoming frustrated, worried, depressed, etc., then you need to have leadership that kind of takes your focus also out from the, the everyday big challenges and puts kind of puts a lighthouse there somewhere, a vision to steer towards, which is important because then you kind of then you focus the energy on creating solutions rather than digging yourself further down into the hole you're in. And that's the function that we have wanted to fill as well. So who would you be interested in listening to in the next shipping podcast? Who do you think I Ooh, should meet? In the next shipping podcast? Oh, there's so many people I find. Uh, I think, you know, Paddy Rogers, have you talked to him? 
he will be good. Elizabeth Grigg, Lasse Christoffersen you already talked to, have you? No. Okay, so that's a handful. No. <laughs> there is a really interesting young um, Emirati ship owner that I met uh, last week in Dubai, who is strategy director of Folk Shipping, Suha Bait. She would be a person to talk to. Then you have um, Sabrina Chow of Warquang. Those so, are a few <laughs> names that I would really like to hear from. So now I've got a handful of them. Yeah. I don't need more suggestions for the next year. No, I'm, I'm joking. It's no, good. I'm coming to Oslo. I'm yeah. coming to Oslo. I haven't decided when, but no. I will do that. And I will try to make as many interviews as possible. Mm. Because I think yeah, there are so many things happening. Yeah, there are. But first I promise to go to Copenhagen. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah but that's fine. It's okay. It's nearby. It's a, <laughs> it is, it's, yeah nearby. Thank you very much Birgit for your time and best of luck with the Norse shipping. Thank you. I hope I will attend next year. Yeah, I hope too. Yeah. I okay. think it will be amazing. We'll have the first African delegation going next year and um, there are um, many things happening now. Yeah. But, uh, so we happens. work hard and we have a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I'm so happy that we finally got the time to sit down and talk together. I think what Birgit is doing is amazing. I have asked Birgit about where you can suggest influential women in the maritime industry. And she says that Fair Play will be releasing a list. I'm sure we will be hearing about that very soon. Birgit is my 26th female guest out of the 55. So you do the maths. This was my last interview from the Vista International AGM in 2016. So next week, I went to Stockholm to make an interview for you. But I won't hold you anymore. I'm off to Copenhagen now. I'm going to be on a panel called The Human Face of Digital. That will be interesting. So from me to you, until the next time, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast where the maritime professionals are talking about their everyday job.